I've got to get busy and tell these people this. And so I don't have time to be copying and writing things down. Hey, what? Jesus and his disciples were too busy to write anything down, and that's why they all did it later? Are you seriously going with that argument? Hello, this is Michael Beverly. Welcome to my channel. This is another edition of Scripture Scrutiny, where I look at various topics in the text. Errors, admissions, contradictions, weird things are just different ways people look at it. I'm not a Bible scholar, not claiming to be a scholar, not claiming to read Greek or Hebrew or have any special knowledge. But what I do is listen to what some different people say. I look at what a layman like myself might find as problematic. And I ask you to just look at it yourself and decide for yourself what makes the most sense. But as it became apparent that Jesus was not coming right back as they had suspected him to, they said, whoa, we better start capturing these stories. We better start writing these things down. We better start preserving these stories for future generations. So Alan Parr is making a very weird admission here. He's admitting that Jesus told everybody he was coming right back. And if he's not admitting that, then why didn't they write stuff down? Like if Jesus knew he was coming back way in a long time, the future generations would need this stuff written down accurately. Can't have it both ways, Christians. If Jesus knew that he was not coming back right away, why did he tell everybody? And even out of what, out, even just take what Alan just said at face value. He said, when it became apparent Jesus wasn't coming back, they all had a holy crap moment and started writing stuff down. That's going to be important when we get into our scriptures in Mark today, because there's a big error in some translations or, or the other one. And we don't know because we don't know what Jesus actually said. And that's apparent by the translation conflict. And that was one of the reasons why they started writing the Gospels. Remember, culture started moving from an oral communication to written communication. So they needed to make sure that they kept up with the times. Now, apparently, Alan Parr hasn't heard about the Jews. Because, to see, the Jews wrote stuff down. They'd been writing stuff down for a long time. In fact, the what the Christians call the Old Testament was written in this book called the Septuagint, which is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures. This had been around for a while. So Alan is just blowing shit out of his butt. He either doesn't know what he's talking about or he's lying to people. I suspect he's just naive, but it's it's very telling when these Christian apologists say stupid, naive stuff. Like, I, again, I'm not a scholar, but come on, don't tell me that that don't tell me you're a Christian preacher and you don't know what the Septuagint is. Jeez. OK, now, in case anybody knows Alan Parr, wants to, you know, set him straight a little bit, he can just go over here to this thing called Wikipedia. It's a thing on it's it's on something called the Internet. And if you notice here, the Septuagint, or the translation of the 70, often abbreviated LXX, well, we have fragments. Oh, look right there. Dating back to about 300 plus years before the time, the supposed birth of Jesus. So, so it... it it's estimated that the, the Septuagint was finished up somewhere maybe in, uh, you know, around 100 BCE, give or take. I mean, some of this stuff might be off by a few years or so, but it seems like it was completed between 100 BCE and 300 BEC, roughly. Now, I bring up the Septuagint only to make the point is that Septuagint wasn't original writings. The Septuagint was Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew books, the Torah, the Pentateuch, you know, the, the Tanakh. Like, and so those things existed going back even farther. And yet a Alan's going to have us tell us, what is he trying to say? That Jesus and the apostles were a bunch of dumb country bumpkins and they didn't know what, they didn't know anything about writing stuff down. Yo, know, Jesus, you think we should write down some of this important stuff you're talking about? Well, I don't think so, Peter. I'm so important and I'm coming back real fast. Nobody needs, we don't need to write stuff down. I ought to be, after they kill me, I'll be, I'll be coming right back. 
Come on, people. When you listen to guys like Alan Parr and your brain cells don't just start evaporating out of your ears, there's something wrong with you. It's just dishonest. And I hate to make light of it, but these Christian apologists just piss me off because they're so dishonest. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand. Okay, now remember we're in Mark chapter 1. Jesus is starting off his ministry. He gets baptized. He gets tempted by the devil. He goes into a synagogue and casts out a demon. Then he heals uh, the, the mother-in-law of Peter of a fever. And then he, he he's healing lots of people. The whole town comes to him. So in verse 35, it, it says very early in the morning, while it's still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So we traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. In verse 40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. Now, this is the NIV that I'm reading from. And the last little clip of Jesus, he used the word indignant. But if you notice right before that clip, there was a clip from The Chosen, which had Jesus being moved by pity. There's other verses that have Jesus being moved with compassion. Now, what are we to make of this? This isn't just a small word choice because being indignant is a lot different from being moved with compassion or having pity. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. Now, I'm not claiming that this difference changes some theology. Obviously, most of us would agree that there are times when it's appropriate to be angry, and that wouldn't be something we would say is always a sin or unethical or immoral or wrong. But Jesus was indignant is confusing here. Why is Jesus mad at the leper? The text doesn't tell us, and the other texts, other translations, apparently have Jesus being moved with compassion or having pity. In any case, the leprosy left him immediately. The guys cleansed and Jesus sent him away with a, at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Hey, what's up? Welcome to the Christian Bro Code YouTube channel. I'm your bro, Mario Escobedo. So I'm going through the Gospel of Mark. I'm doing a Bible study on the Gospel of Mark. And the purpose for doing this is that I want to learn how to grow as a disciple of Jesus. Que anda cabrón. So why is this guy the Bro Code? Why is he studying Mark? Well, for a different reason for me. I'm studying Mark because I like to dive into the truth. And I found that these Christian disciples like to study the Bible so they can recommit themselves to Jesus. They can reassure themselves that they believe the truth, that they can feel. I mean, sometimes it's virtual signaling. What I know for a fact is there's a whole, whole, whole bunch of Christianities. And if you go back historically, there was even more Christianities. And my contention is, I can't trust any of you all to tell me which is the right version. If you can acknowledge that the earliest copies of the text that we have are quite late, and that's just the historic reality, then you don't know how many other words got changed now, do you? Now, what do Christians like to say? They like to say, oh, we have so many copies of the New Testament and the church fathers wrote stuff down. We could recreate the whole Bible just from church father quotes. And we have copies like 
it's way better than Homer. All of those are non sequiturs. What you don't have is the originals or the copies of 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 the copies. I'm not doing a study on every single passage in Mark, but I'm trying to look very specifically for those passages that talk about something that Jesus did that I can imitate. Now, this one hits a little close to home because the last church before I deconstructed and became an atheist that I was part of was the Vineyard. Now, the Vineyard was founded by a guy named, a guy named John Wimber. Carrying on, John Wimber's thing was doing the stuff. So he said, hey, when I was in the world, the devil let me do you know, all the stuff like drugs and parties and sex and good times and rock and roll. So when I came to become a Christian, I wanted to, quote, do the stuff, meaning go out and do the stuff Jesus did. So what, what bro code guy here is saying is he wants to read in Mark about stuff or in the Gospels to do as his disciple. So I'm, I'm trying to learn how to do this. So now when I hear Christians say they want to do the stuff Jesus did, I always wonder, like, are you guys trying to raise the dead? No, they don't do that. Are you trying to feed a big group of people with two fish and a few loaves of bread? No. Are you walking on water? No. Are you stopping storms? No. Are you are you are you doing anything we can actually verify and test? Like you hear all these stories about Jesus curing people, but you never actually see any evidence of it. It's a people's testimony. Come on. I don't know. Some, I don't want to accuse people of being dishonest, but sometimes it sounds like you guys are trying to sell me a load of BS. The passage we just read brings chapter one to a close and concentrates upon Jesus' encounter with one particular man, a man with leprosy, a man who was an outcast because of this condition and because of the customs set out in the Jewish law, the extensive details of which are set out in Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. They applied not exclusively to leprosy as such, but also to a range of infectious skin diseases. Some of these were highly contagious, and it was understandable that infected people would wish to still stay well clear. So it makes perfect sense that the law of Moses kept the lepers away from the people because the, de the diseases, whether it was leprosy or other skin diseases, were highly contagious. But then that seems to prove that there was no godly miracles going on. Why didn't God just heal these people? Was it free will? So it, it, then we're told Jesus shows up and he heals some lepers. They obviously didn't heal leprosy. Now, when scientists set out to, to cure smallpox, polio, whooping cough, I think they were pretty successful, don't you? Since I was born in Hawaii, I know a little bit about the stories of Molokai. So here's a short clip about Father Damien. Now I ask you, if Jesus was healing leprosy, and Jesus and Christians believe in miracles, why did the why did the the British Empire and the Catholic Church create a leper colony? Why not just cure everybody? Why not just pray and get and get healing instead of having all the suffering that went on? A place which has turned into a living hell. Now, you might wonder real real fast, this is some kind of a sidebar, why why the, that was Brit, those were Brits talking about this thing. So at the, at the end of the, at the end of the 19th century, Hawaii was used by the British and the Americans. Now, part of the reason that the Hawaii state flag has the Union Jack, but also has stripes on it. The kind of so it kind of looks like a mix of the American flag and the and the and the British flag. So the story goes is that is that Hawaii was trying to kind of stay neutral, and you know, long story short, Hawaii ended up in the hands of the Americans. They sort of a bloodless coup overthrew the the Hawaiian monarchy. You know, yada, 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 American imperialism and sugar and pineapple and et cetera, et cetera. But the reason I included that clip about leprosy is the, the, 
you know, it's kind of a good story and a bad story. So the good part of it is everybody recognized that if they didn't isolate highly infectious people with leprosy, that the disease would spread and affect, you know, it would hurt more people. And they, you know, of course, they didn't have a cure back then. And of course, the church was powerless to pray for people and get them healed, obviously. So this leper colony is created on on Molokai and Father Damien. And, you know, he goes there to serve and he ends up catching leprosy and dies. So, you know, he's he was he was actually made like a saint by a pope later. And that part that part is kind of a good story. Like, OK, that, you know, the, here's this disease and people had to deal with it in some way. But the, but the terrible part about it was there were often people, including children, who were suspected of having leprosy that were taken to Molokai and literally just thrown off the boat, like swim to shore and we don't want to be around you. And of course, you can imagine what would happen on a colony of people that are all diseased. They all know they're going to die. And they also know people are afraid to come around them. When you throw off young kids, use your imagination about the amount of abuse and just terrible, terrible things that happen to people. So there were people that there were people that were thrown to Molokai being suspected of having leprosy that didn't actually have it. And of course, they contracted it once they got thrown into the colony. All this is to say at the end of the day. It seems clear to me that choosing science over superstition and religion leads to a lot better outcomes for people. Leprosy was not cured by Jesus. Leprosy was cured by science, same as smallpox and polio and so forth. So this wraps up our little study here in Mark chapter one. So next week I'll be going on to Mark chapter two. And just to recap here, the biggest thing in this section that I think is important is recognizing that the different translations decide different things. One says Jesus was indignant. Other translations say he was moved with either pity or compassion. And if you take that back to its logical conclusion, you can know with a great deal of certainty that we don't actually know for sure what things Jesus actually said or did. This is Michael Beverly. Thank you for joining me, and I'll catch you on the next video. Please like, subscribe, and share.